years. Now, your, your, your father said Kennedy was, Kennedy was too cautious a politician, that he always used less power than he had to, whereas Lyndon Johnson always used more power than he had to. Is Barack Obama, on the economic front, too cautious? From the very beginning, what President Obama did was to uh, continue, and in some cases promote, the officials who were responsible for the previous policies. Uh, he took Secretary Geithner from the presidency of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and made him uh, Treasury Secretary. He reappointed Chairman Bernanke. He took Larry Summers, uh, who had been a significant figure in the Clinton administration, and brought him back into the White House. This meant that he was never going to get a forceful presentation of the true alternatives, of a true change. Now, without quarreling with what people did at particular moments, they're not going to turn on their own legacies. And he had to have known this from the very beginning. And the result was that the moment when you could have gone to the American public and said, the scope of this calamity is larger than anything we have seen in our lives, and it is going to require immediate and very forceful action on a scale greater than we've seen, or we will not succeed, passed. Instead, what happened was that he allowed the administration to say, oh, well, it's not so bad. Unemployment is going to peak uh, at 8% in the summer of 2009. And that was more than just a dumb forecast. It meant that when unemployment went up above 8%, the responsibility fell on the new administration rather than the old. And it became impossible to make the political case that the policies that they had, that they had agreed to were even the right policies, let alone that they were sufficient. Why did you think, why do you think, looking back, he did that? And this is not a, a nostalgic mm -hmm. question. It's a question to examine the nature of a mind at work trying to make decisions. Why do you think he chose those people to, since he had a mandate to bring the change you can believe in, why did he, you think he chose those particular economic and financial figures? I mean, I remember in October of 2008 when you were on the journal, we were right in the middle of the meltdown, and I said, what scares you the most? And your answer, remember your answer? Your answer was, I'm afraid Phil Graham's gonna become Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> Phil Graham was a Texas Senator representing Galbraith in the Senate uh, and other Texans. And uh, he had been the architect of, uh, of the financial deregulation under, in, in the latter years of the Clinton administration. I, I told the Washington Post that he was the sorcerer's apprentice of financial instability and disaster. Yeah. Uh, but they, put, they put that on the front page above the fold, but what was even better was they called up Phil Graham and read it to him and he said, I deny it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you didn't get Phil Graham, you got Tim Geithner instead. And, 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 and why do you think that he reached into the cautious barrel to pull out his candidate? Well, for a long time now, let's face it, the Democratic Party has been fundamentally divided between its broad voting base uh, and a, a, a leadership which is heavily, on economic questions, drawn almost exclusively from the financial sector. And that's the, re that's the reality. The re even the Republicans under George W. Bush had a broader commercial and industrial base than the Democrats do. Uh, they are, we, and what Barack Obama did uh, was to uh, turn economic policy over to a committee of uh, uh, senior figures from the financial sector. He did that, he surrounded himself with those figures in order to lend respectability and credibility to the campaign in the late summer, early fall of 2008. And from that point onward, I think the course was sealed. It would, you, 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 if you have that group who were deeply compromised by the crisis, uh, essentially guiding policy going forward, the one thing that is certain is that they will protect their own interests, and that's, that's what we've observed. What do you make of the early uh, sounds and signs from the White House in response to the debt commission that the president appointed to advise the government on what to do about the debt? Uh, it was, it's his commission, his idea, worked out with a number of members of, of, mm -hmm. of Congress, 
And last week's news was generated by the two chair of it. it wasn't, it's this, the report's not out. We don't even know what's in the report. But these two chairmen deciding to take the initiative, co-chairs, went out and said what they, everybody in this room knows they said. And Obama's response was, well, there's some, there's some possibilities of compromise there. What, is that a political game going on? or do you, what is, How do you read it? Uh, I think he's kicking the can down the road. Um, the, the debt commission uh, came out with a series of proposals that would gut, uh, in effect, every major program that protects the middle class and the poor in this country. The mortgage uh, interest tax deduction, the earned income tax credit, Social Security, Medicare. Did it have in it um, a financial transactions tax? Guess what? No, it didn't. Somehow that one didn't get all, all the oxes that got gored, all the whales that got harpooned. That one still swimming out there in the great financial seas. Uh, did they have a, a higher rate on the income tax for extremely high earners? No, it, that's not there either. Uh, so even if you accept the premise that we're in some kind of deficit and debt crisis, which is a premise that I think is profoundly false as an economist, the uh, orientation of this pair was to, uh, in effect, undo the New Deal, the Great Society, an entire century of, uh, of, of, of social progress and stabilization. Uh, what we're seeing now is that this is plainly an, a, an unrealistic proposal, and to her credit, Speaker Pelosi has already said firmly it's totally unacceptable. Uh, we're seeing a proliferation of uh, other efforts. I know that, saw that Alice Rivlin and, and Pete Domenici came up with one, uh, which uh, has its own significant problems. But there will be uh, there will be many, and I suspect that the whole exercise will degenerate into. A, a, Chaos, uh, chaos and incoherence, which I'm, I'm looking forward to, frankly. <laughs> you, well, we journalists like that, too. Uh -huh. you, but as a citizen, I don't. I mean, I do, I, I've never seen the people in the country that I know. I've never felt so much angst, uh, uh, despair, and disillusionment in the country as I do now. And I, I think there are probably two reasons for it, as I see it journalistically. One is that the future has always been America, the American dream, that tomorrow will be better than today, and my children will do better than I did. And mo the polls show most people don't think, 76% of the people don't believe that now. The other is this sense of paralysis. I know that some people sing the virtue of deadlock because they say if you have deadlock in government, nothing bad happens. But our inability to solve some of these creeping and overarching problems seems to have taken hold, uh, the perception that we can't solve them seems to have taken hold out there. And the most visible for ordinary people that I've talked to is, is the deficit. Bringing me back to something you said on our show, uh, when you indicated what you just said a moment ago, the deficit as a problem to our democracy is overrated. You just indicated a moment ago yeah, you course. still believe that. Why is it overrated? Well, we have, what, 15 million unemployed people in the country. That's a problem. We're going to face a major challenge uh, with our energy supplies in the near future. That's a problem. We have an on-rushing problem of climate change. That's a very serious problem. The deficit is an accounting artifact. The things that people claim to be concerned about, the th issue that they claim to be concerned about, is that the capital markets will turn on the United States uh, and drive up the interest rate uh, and make it impossible for the US to borrow as uh, the situation similar to what's being experienced by Greece. That's not going to happen. And the capital markets don't actually expect it to happen. And if you want to be persuaded of that, pick up the paper and look at the interest rate on a 30-year Treasury bond. If the capital markets believed the Congressional Budget Office's forecast that the short-term interest rate was going to go up to 5% in the next five years, they wouldn't be selling long-term bonds to the US government at 4%. They wouldn't be doing it. They're taking, locking up their money for a return much less than they would be able to get with very liquid money in a few years. They don't think this is going to happen. So what they're talking about it and what they're doing with their funds are entirely different things. Uh, and we need to recognize that this is an issue which is, has been manipulated for decades, essentially for political purposes. What is at stake here is whether we will continue to have a stable and effective Social Security 
system a stable and effective Medicare program, uh, or whether these programs will be chipped away in the interests of essentially the, 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 the fund industry which, uh, and the insurance industry, which would pick up some pieces of a broken uh, uh, public security system. What, what to be a leader, back to our question, what would, what would Obama say right now if he took the leadership on this issue? I think he would say that we need, again, to address the problems that we have. Let's do something about jobs, something serious about jobs, something serious about unemployment. And the two are not quite the same because a great many people who are currently looking for work would be better off if they had an option of a comfortable retirement. So older workers who are not, in fact, going to find good jobs, and it's a futile exercise to force them to, uh, to look for them. And that's why I've suggested rather than increasing the retirement age on Social Security, we ought to be uh, considering giving people an opportunity to retire earlier with full benefits for a period so that we can take care of some of the people who have been permanently displaced as a result of the crisis. What about unemployment? What, what, would, what do you think well, is a liberal... Well, the effect of that would be to reduce unemployment because people would stop looking for work. And they would also have stable income so they would be able to provide work uh, in the form of, of, of services and care, uh, caring jobs for other people. So what, you're, what you need to do with this enormous human problem is to balance out the number of jobs you can reasonably create with the number of people who actually want and need jobs. And if you can reduce that second number, which you can do with an effective uh, modification of the retirement rules, uh, then uh, the unemployment problem could be reduced substantially in a short period of time. How do you account for the fact that liberal economics, I, I think more of it as social, de social de democratic uh, uh, e economics, has no hearing in Washington today? It, there are economists, yourself, and Dean Baker, and, and, and Krugman, who write and, and, and speak to the issues of social democracy, but they are not, there's no evidence that they're heard. What has happened in both parties is that the, uh, the, the uh, power has devolved on to the major funders. Uh, and this is, this is a, the popular organization has virtually uh, faded from the scene. Uh, and the result of this is, is, is very much a, uh, a bipartisan um, uh, confluence on certain issues. But I, th I think even um, beyond that, there has also grown up a kind of local industry in, in Washington uh, with a very narrow group of, uh, of, of policy uh, intellectuals and spokespeople who are, um, hold, hold very strong market positions in the media and in the debate. They're on call all the time. They're available, and those are the people who you're going to see uh, discussing these issues in public forums. Uh, one of the reasons that I didn't want to stay in Washington after my, my uh, time on the congressional staff was uh, that I, I found that, that environment much too confining. Much better. Te intellectual liberty is much greater in Texas. <laughs>